Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Roger McKenzie, the Chief Editorial Coordinator for Charlton Neo Comics. Roger, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, uh, Charlton, as I recall, was a comic company, uh, sort of a third string comic company out of Connecticut uh, that is best known for being the place where Steve Ditko went after he left Spider-Man and Dick Giordano sort of started his career. Uh, so how is it that we went from uh, a company that sort of disappeared to a resurgence of uh, Charlton under Charlton Neo? Oh, well, it happened because of Facebook, actually. Um, a, a, a guy named Fester Faceplant started a uh, Charlton fan page. And uh, it went from there to uh, Paul Kupperberg showed up. And they got to talking about doing a fanzine. And I had been out of comics for, for quite some time at that point and had finally decided, well, let me give it one more shot. So I went on Facebook to see what Marvel and DC were up to. Because I hadn't even looked at comics in like for years. And uh, I wanted to know, uh, find out if there were still anybody left at Marvel or DC that I knew from back in the day. And I don't know to this day how it happened, but I, I, I wound up on the Charlton Arrow page. And I saw my old friend Paul Kupperberg on there. So so I, I said, uh, I, I messaged uh, F Fester Faceplant. He's the, the guy that, that was running, uh, runs the site. And um, I said, hey, can I write something? He said, sure. So I figured I'd write a story get it out of my system, you know, and, and call it good. Well, one thing led to another to another, and, and suddenly we had a an actual comic book on our hands. And from there, um, it just kind of grew. And um, as of, well, we're supposed to have a, our, our, our second book has left the printer that is for um, uh, direct sales. And I should have a copy of that probably tomorrow. So we're now in we're now in comic shops, and our first issue sold out in like a couple of days, and it's going going pretty well. So what is it about uh, comics that um, is is uh, I guess the medium that that you work in to tell stories? I mean, uh, what is it about those those four color characters? Although. They use a wider palette these days. Uh, but what is it about that, that medium that makes you want to tell stories? Well, I always loved comic books. I, I, I tried my best to get out of my system, and I couldn't. I, I think it's just more of a, a passion and a love for, for the medium. Because, uh, well, back in the day, now I'm no spring chicken. Back in the day, there were three TV stations that we got total. I was the remote control. I sit by the TV, and then mom and dad said, change channel, kid. <laughs> so that's what I did. Um, I started reading comics around 1956 or so. I think dad bought me my first one. The first book I remember having, and I know I had some before that, the first book I remember was the showcase issue where they reintroduced the Flash. That's the first, that was like number four, I think. That's like the first comic I remember. The first Marvel comic that I paid any attention to was, was Fantastic Four number five. So I went back and, and you know, got, then you could you could go back and uh, they were just on the spinner racks and in drug stores and, and everywhere. You could find comics everywhere. So, you know, it was just, I've always loved comics. I... I I don't know if there is an explanation to it or not. It's just fun. And uh, early on, I found out, well, I, I couldn't draw. I mean, that it, I, I'd need classes to draw stick figures. It's that bad. But uh, I could write, so that's what I did as a, as a kid. I wrote all my, my horrible little stories, and over time, you just get better. Or at least, thankfully, I did. To, to a point where I broke in at uh, Warren Comics in uh, my first story was published in 1975. For, um, I was in Vampirella number 50. And from there, um, 
I started to pester the, the folks at DC and Marvel at that time with no internet and no email and none of that stuff. You had to live there. And of course, I was down in Kentucky at the time. You had to actually be there or close by so you could actually go in the office and, and do all that kind of stuff that you need to do. So I saved up my money writing the Warren stories and flew to New York and got on as uh, DC's proofreader of all things. So I, I had a desk job for a while and, and wrote some uh, short stories for, for DC at the time We're in Weird War Tales and in some of the mystery books they were doing back then. And um, could walk up the street and over to uh, Madison Avenue and, and talk to the guys at Marvel. And um, I pestered poor Archie Goodwin. I pestered him to death till he finally gave me a story to get me out of his hair. So we did that. It was a, a five-page uh, Havoc story, uh, one of the, the X-Men characters. And um, as far as I know, it was never published. And I heard that Michael Golden was going to be the artist on Whether he drew it or not, I have no idea. I doubt that he did because I probably would have seen it if he'd done so. But uh, and from there, um, Archie gave me a call not long afterwards wanting to know if I wanted to write Ghost Rider and Daredevil. So that, you know, he launched my Marvel career. And it's interesting because Ghost Rider was one of those characters that sort of burst onto the scene. And uh, I remember having an issue of um, Marvel team up with Ghost Rider. Um, and he had his own book for a while, obviously. Uh, so you take over that book and then you end up going over to Daredevil and working with uh, Frank Miller. Um, so the, from the story that I understand is that you sort of brought uh, Frank Miller with you on the book. And I'm wondering how, as a writer, you have the ability to maybe cajole an editor to get a collaborator that you want to work with on a story. It was, was easy back then to a point. Um, we didn't have a regular artist on the book. When I took it over with issue 151, um, Jim Shooter, who, who had been writing it but had been promoted to like the uh, assistant editor-in-chief or, or some such thing, which took all his time. And he, he couldn't really keep up, you know, doing all that work all day and, 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 and trying to write in the evening and stuff. Just he, he couldn't do it. So um, the first one, I dialogued the story that he had plotted and Gil Kane had drawn. So we went from Gil Kane to Carmine. Um, I was able to cajole Gene Colan into doing several issues. But he was he was basically retired at that point and, and was just doing it because, you know, he couldn't abandon his character. He just couldn't. He'd, he'd done it, you know, and Gene, Gene, you know, just one more, just one more issue. Um, and I met Frank and saw his stuff, and we had done a story at D.C. It was like a two- or a three-page story in the day after Doomsday story and uh, appeared in, in an issue of a Weird War Tales. I forget which one now. But I liked his stuff. So I started talking to the editors at Marvel, and then they just kept dragging their feet, you know. Finally, I said, you know, let's give him a shot. You know, and they did, and, and the rest is history. So, But, you know, you could just tell he had something going even back then when he was still much more influenced by Gil Kane than in later years. That's interesting. I, but, I never thought of uh, the, the Frank Miller-Gil Kane connection, but when you say it, you can kind of see a similarity in that, uh, the, the figure, the way that the, uh, the movement is portrayed. And especially early on. He, he go, as, as most great artists do, he, he moved on to his own style and stuff. You know, over time, it, it happens. But uh, early on, it was very much Gil Kane influenced, which was fine by me. <laughs> I got no problem. You know, Gil Kane, he's, he's one of the best. So, you know, and, and certainly Frank, you know, made his, his own way in his own name. So, you know, it was all good. While you were at Marvel, you also worked on the Battlestar Galactica uh, series. 
And what's it like working on a licensed book? Because it's not like it's a Marvel property. This is owned by, I guess, at the time, Universal, um, or maybe just Glenn A. Larson. So uh, you're working on that book. How much freedom do you have to tell the stories that you want to tell versus what you know, the, the owner of the, the property wants you to tell? Um, after we got done with the original adaptation, which was uh, the the large format, and then they broke it down into like three, I think the first three issues of the regular comic were, were, were that adaptation, which they gave us a working script, you know, and we had to sign the non-disclosure agreements and all that kind of stuff. Um, it wasn't the final script. So <laughs> there, were, there were things that were changed. I think in ours, if memory serves, um, Baltar was killed. Or it might have been the other way around. I don't remember now, but but there were like, you know, some major differences. Um, did you just kind of scratch your head and go, well, why didn't they have us fix that? But after we got to do our own stuff, um, I never heard from them. And I never had an editor say, hey, we can't do this because Universal or Glenn Larson doesn't like it. We need to do this. That never happened to me. The only thing I know that happened was uh, Marvel did not secure the rights to the likenesses of the characters. And um, my good friend Walt Simonson was uh, more than once told, don't draw them so well. <laughs> <laughs> they look too much, like, too much like the characters, and we can't do that. So that's why... You know, he had to redraw some of the some of the faces. But other than that, that we had free reign, as far as I know. And I understand that uh, when you concluded the series, you actually had a a conclusion to the story, and the the television show never had that opportunity uh, well, after they were canceled. Well, I had a uh, I had my comedy resolution to it, uh, where they they finally find Earth and. and uh, the Battlestar is the only ship that survived, and it crashed on Earth. And uh, Adama lost his memory, but uh, became an Earthling and founded the Ponderosa. <laughs> 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 that was that was my. If we had an actual ending, I, I don't remember what it was now. I mean, you either find Earth or you don't, I suppose. Now, you um, also, in the 80s, you were working for a lot of the smaller publishers. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you worked for uh, Pacific and, and um, uh, Eclipse. And, and Eclipse. And Amico. So this is sort of before the, the comics boom of the, the 90s. <laughs> so you're kind of negotiating this, this uncharted water of uh, the smaller publishers, uh, or at least the newer publishers uh, coming into the market. So how did you negotiate those waters and, and how did you choose the projects that you wanted to work on? As I've always done, I just chose the stories that I liked. If, if they resonate with me, and I, I, I've been lucky in that regard, then usually, usually, not always, usually, they will resonate with the fans. Because I'm your classic fanboy geek type, you know, if I like it, well, you know, hey, um, I just uh, wanted to do some different things, and I wanted to kind of, you know, be able to own the own, my own properties. They didn't have any uh, creator-owned agreements that I'm aware of at, at Marvel or DC or anywhere like that, and we did with the independents. Um, there was a boom back then as well, and there was also a boom in the 90s. But uh, independents were fairly big for a while, even before the 90s. Um, well, I, th I, I believe, if memory serves, it was kind of launched by the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Because that, that series hit big, and, and all the little guys tried to get on with their own three adjectives and a noun you know, group of, of, of animals. And uh, there was all sorts of things back then. And uh, it was kind of fun. Um, you know, there those places have their own 
little problems and uh but uh we got to do pretty much what we wanted to do which for me was just the you know the superheroes we did uh sun runners <coughs> and um for pacific um had the backup feature with mike mahogany a uh, wooden detective puppet which uh, paul smith drew and uh at Kamiko, I did Next Man with uh, Vince Argandesi. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to bring that character back. Vince is working on the script even now, doing the art for it. So we're going to bring that one back at Charlton Neo. Well, let's talk a little bit of uh, Charlton Neo. Um, so the, the, the you're actually going the traditional uh, printed route. Um, you've also got some digital content that people can find online and whatnot. Uh, so the stories that you're telling, you get to own the characters, if I'm not mistaken. So it's correct. So yes. it's sort of like a, a a place that you can go and deliver a product, and they're going to kind of share the wealth, so to speak. Uh, well, it's it's even more than that. Um, Charlton Neo does not own the characters at all, nor any of the rights of the characters, other than than the first printing rights. Um, we can take our characters wherever we want to. Um, we're kind of flipping the scenario around. Um, it's not, well, let's say, a well, the, the character that Steve Butler and Mort Todd and I are doing, uh, Mr. Mixit. If that one were to hit, you know, lightning in a bottle and, and you know, Hollywood loves it and they want to make underoos and all that stuff, we would get the pie and, and you know, would give Charlton Neo a slice of that pie as opposed to, you know, Marvel and DC getting the pine and saying, here's your little slice. It's, it's just, it's flipped backwards because unlike Marvel or DC, well, here we are, I'm working out of my home. We have no offices. This is the age, this is the internet. Anybody can do this now. We're just, you know, filling in a gap at this point. We're, we're all, we've got over a, between me and, and Paul Kupperberg, who's uh, the executive editor, and Mort, we've got combined over 100 years' experience in doing comic books. You're working with a creative team uh, right now, and I'm wondering how that process works. Is it is it something where you're just writing the scripts, or are you all talking about what the plot will be, and then you do your part, and the artists do their part? Uh, so I'm wondering how that all comes together. It varies with the, the project, frankly, and, and w with me, uh, it just depends on how the artist wants to work. Um, I, I'll do full script um, with uh, Mr. Mixit. We talk a lot on, on we message a lot on Facebook, uh, me and, and Stephen and, and Mort. And we just throw ideas back and forth. And um, actually, we started working, and it's worked out real well so far. We started doing the, what's known as the Marvel Method. Which you, you probably well aware of uh, somebody out there that doesn't know. Um, other than writing a full script, which looks very much like a screenplay, you write it panel by panel and put in the captions and the dialogue and, and describe for the artist, you know, what that panel looks like. You know, Spider-Man swings across the city or Mr. Mixit fights, whatever. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, Marvel Method, we work out a plot synopsis which I hand to Stephen, who does the, the pencils for it, and then more inks and, and letters and colors it. So, um, you know, that gives the artist free reign to design the pages however they want to. I don't, you know, it, it, it's not a situation where I can say, you know, all right, panel, uh, page two has six panels. And we do this and this. it's entirely up to Stephen. And he is so good. I can just, I can let him go. So this is a, truly a throwback to the days when, when Stan Lee might say to Jack Kirby, okay, uh, the Fantastic Four fights God, give me 20 pages and I'll see you next Thursday or something. Uh, it's along that line. We're a little more back and forth. I mean, we actually, you know, I will we'll actually do a, a somewhat detailed synopsis to keep all the stuff in mind because we've got like more, more ideas than we know what to do with. And, um, but yes, it, it's very much that way. 
Now, with all the ideas that you're talking about, uh, and obviously the goal is to keep publishing uh, monthly or bi-monthly or whatever the schedule is. So do you have a, a grand narrative worked out so you know that you know, after this issue and this storyline, we've got the next storyline and this, the character's going to learn this and this? Uh, I guess the question is, are you planning far ahead? The way I plan far ahead is to have you know, long-range goals, but no specifics on exactly how to get there. Because to me, the fun of the story is the new things that spring up that you hadn't thought about before. And you're, you're right in the middle of a storyline, and then all of a sudden the characters say, no, we want to go over here now. We want to do this. We want to do something different. And you're going, whoa, okay. And it's for me, it's more organic. Yes, I can sit down and I can write, a, I can plot stuff out for the next two or three years, and that's not fun, though. No. Not for us. We, we pretty much the seat of our britches. We know where we're going, but we don't particularly care how we get there. So it's sort it's of like a, make, a structured improvisation, so to speak. Exactly. Well, that's good because I guess from a, a creator standpoint, you have a, a, an idea, you, you talk about it with the penciler, you get those pages back and that gives you the, the option to sort of say, where I was going, I can change because this leads it here or maybe I don't need to say something that I thought I would have to say. Mm -hmm. or, or we do a synopsis and we just had this happen. I'd done the uh, synopsis for, for a, an upcoming story and things changed so now I'm in the I'm in the middle of rewriting the synopsis because we came up with a whole new a whole new thing which is better than the first one so hey that's just the way it goes it doesn't interfere with where we're going to wind up it's just a better way to get there and those things happen and we like the freedom of being able to you know, we answer to each other because, well, Mort's the publisher. And as far as I know, this is like maybe the only time in comic book history where the publisher is also the artist, you know, the inker, the letterer, the colorist. It's, you know, it's just, it, it, it's a lot of fun. And, and speaking of fun, um, we have about three minutes or so left in our conversation. Um, Charlton Neo seems to have a lot of fun characters, which is a, a departure from some of the more serious approaches taken by, let's say, Image or DC or Marvel. Not that they don't have books that are, are fun or light, but it seems to be a, a conscious effort to, to make Charlton Neo books a little bit more uh, entertaining. What's exactly it? Um, I told you I was out of comics for a while, and what it was, I'd, I'd get the bug to write some, do comics again. I'd, I'd go into a comic book shop like once every five or six years, and I'd just look at the books, and I'd just shake my head and I'd leave. There was nothing there that is of any interest to me whatsoever. I just figured, they had moved on you know the comic books that I do and that I liked which was all the old DC and then Marvel stuff from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and all that that had all changed it was all gone and, and the stuff I was looking at and it holds true to the most part today just weren't fun they just weren't they all looked the same kind of go wait I'm not going to spend three or four dollars for this book which I, I can't read past page three so yeah we're just trying to do fun stuff well Roger I'm being told that we are out of time I, I'd like to thank you so much for taking time out to talk to us today and I'd like to thank the folks working on your roof thank you so much for being with us today thank you at home for watching comic culture we'll see you again soon